Holy God, uh, you, uh, you want to sanctify us. You want to make us holy in everything that we do. In the way that we talk, the way we think, the way we treat other people, all aspects of our life. And the way that you do that is through your word. Jesus prayed, sanctify us by the truth, because your word is truth. And so, Lord, help us to listen this morning. Help us to hear your word to us. We don't want to just fill our minds with information just for the sake of filling our minds with information. We want your word to change us. And Lord, we pray that you do that. I pray for myself, oh Lord. I ask that you would help me to speak clearly, to speak words of truth and grace, so that it really won't be my words or my thoughts or my ideas that I communicate, but your words, because your words alone can change us. And so we pray that you favor us with your presence and do just that. In Christ's name, amen. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, we've been looking at uh, the book of 1 Peter for, I think this is our third week, we're spending uh, the whole fall uh, looking at this letter from Peter to the churches. And you, were, if you were here the last couple weeks, uh, I said early on that, well, I said every book of the Bible has a, has a theme that kind of ties the whole book together, and I compared it to a, like a musical theme. If you watch movies, you know, the soundtrack is kind of woven through the whole movie. If you, uh, you know, you go to the symphony, you know, symphonies have the same thing. There's kind of a theme that unites these things together. And then I said that uh, biblical books uh, really have the same thing. There's a theme that ties the whole book of the Bible together. And uh, if we really want to understand the, the heart of a book of the Bible, we, we need to be able to recognize what that theme is. And, and then we need to kind of keep coming back to that and, and, and looking at the whole book through the lens of that theme. Now, as a kind of a working theme, I, I suggested to you that, uh, that Peter is talking to the church and he's speaking to the church about holy living, H-O-L-Y, holy living as sojourners, strangers in this world who are suffering for the sake of the gospel. All right? did you catch that? Let me just say that one more time. This is the theme of the whole book. <clears throat> holy living as sojourners who are suffering for the gospel. <clears throat> now we spent a little bit of time looking at uh, sojourners, what it means that we live as strangers in this world, and this morning we're looking at the idea of holiness. Now I don't know about you, when you hear that word holiness, you're to be, a, you're to be holy people. What comes right to mind? Holiness. Holy people. I don't know about you, but I, I always think of people who are, you know, they spend like 18 hours a day praying or reading their Bibles. Maybe you think of people who have, have dedicated their whole life to, to service and to ministry, going overseas, going to faraway places to tell people about Jesus. And we would look at that and say, you know, that's, that's a holy person. And then you look at your own life, your life of running errands and commuting to work and going to school and taking care of your parents, taking care of your children, and you say, you know, I don't really think much of that has anything to do with holiness. We don't usually equate those two things together, do we? Holiness in everyday life. I, I was talking to a friend some time back, he's a doctor, and uh, he was telling me a little bit about his work, and he, and he actually said something that stayed with me. He said, uh, he said, I meet with people sometimes and they're in very dark places in life. They're struggling with this or that. And he says, but I found that when I'm talking to them, when I'm meeting with them, even when they're in very discouraging places, he said, I've, I've noticed that, that they, there can be holy moments in those sorts of experiences. And he was rightly understanding this idea that holiness can happen in places uh, where you wouldn't maybe expect it to happen. Holiness is not just something for a select group of Christians. It's not just something for something that happens when you're praying or reading your Bible. Holiness happens in very everyday settings. Holiness happens in everyday settings. In fact, if we listen carefully to the Bible, and if we take seriously what the Bible says to us, holiness is actually not an option for us. Holiness is not something that we can choose to pursue 
or not. It's not something we can leave to one group of people and not to others. If we take Jesus seriously, if we take the Bible seriously, then holiness is required of us. God wants us to be holy. He expects us to be holy. In fact, in our text this morning, he commands us to be holy. Now, I want you to look for, for a moment. If you have your Bible still open, I want you to just pay attention to a couple little structure, structural things. This is kind of like looking beneath the hood of a car for a moment so we can get the kind of the inner workings of this text. Verses 15 and 16. This is sort of the driving point of this passage. This is, I think, the main idea. Peter says, be holy for I am holy. Right? I'm summarizing that, those two verses there. That's the, that's the heartbeat of this whole text. God commands his people to be holy. Be holy because I am holy. And then in verses 13 and 14, he's actually going to show us what that looks like. So in verses 13 and 14, Peter tells us what we need to do. Verses 15 and 16, the heartbeat of the text, he gives us the rationale. And then in verses 17 onward, he's going to unpack more about what it looks like to live holy lives. So verses 15 and 16 for the moment are what I want us to, to start with. Be holy as God who called you is holy. You be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Now, whenever you see those words in your Bible, whenever you come across that little phrase, for it is written, you almost always know it's going back to the Old Testament. And in this case, that's exactly what Peter's doing. He's quoting from a book of the Bible. He's quoting from the book of Leviticus. We actually looked at that book earlier this morning. But Peter's quoting from Leviticus chapter 19. Now, Leviticus is one of these books of the Bible you know, if you, I don't know, some of you have maybe done that where you try to read through the Bible in a year, and, uh, and you start off with Genesis, and Genesis is actually fairly easy reading. It's got a lot of those great stories, stories that are fairly easy to understand. And you get into Exodus. Exodus has the story of the ten plagues, and there's some good reading there, and then you, it's a little harder near the end. Now, you hit the book of Leviticus, and it's uphill from there. At least that's how it can feel, right? Because Leviticus has all these laws and all these rituals and all these ceremonies and things that deal with the most unusual things. It actually has rules about how you have to handle your tableware and how you have to handle mold in your home and all these other things and you're scratching your head wondering what in the world is this all about? How is this possibly relevant to me? Leviticus can be a very challenging book to read. But you know what? The theme of Leviticus is actually all about holiness. And actually what, what God is telling his people in the book of Leviticus, he's saying, I have called you to be my people, you belong to me, and because you are in a relationship with me, and because I am a holy God, I want you to be holy, and I want you to see that holiness is, is, is something that involves every facet of your life. Holiness is not something that you do on Sunday, it's not something you do one day of the week, holiness involves every aspect of your life. And so when Peter quotes Leviticus, he's drawing all that to mind. He's saying, dear church, I want you to understand that you are called to be holy in every aspect of your life. Every moment of your life is to be holy. Holiness is for all of life. Now, what does holiness mean? What, what exactly is that? Well, if you were here a couple weeks ago, you remember that uh, I used, I'm going to be real careful here, but I used the analogy of, of fine china. And I, I, I said that, you know, most of you have probably fine china in your home somewhere. You've got fancy dishes, you've got fancy silverware and wine glasses. And you don't just use those when you're going to have mac and cheese in front of the TV, right? I mean, you use that for a special purpose. Those plates, those forks, those knives and spoons and wine glasses are set apart for a special purpose. And, and that's, that's not a perfect analogy, I understand that, but that's, that does help us get at the idea of what holiness is. To be holy is to be set apart. To be holy, it's a very basic level, to be holy means to be set apart. Now, you notice what Peter does. Peter says, God is holy. And so if we want to understand more about holiness, we can look at, well, how is God set apart? And I think there are at least two ways that, that are helpful, and then these two ways will shape how we think about how we're called to be holy. Okay, you with me? Here's what God is. God is holy. Two ways that he's holy, and those will help us understand how we are holy. The first way, God is, is set apart from sin. 
There is no imperfection, there is no flaw, there is no blemish, there is no shortcoming, there is no, no kind of sin in any way in God. God is absolutely, utterly, completely, 100% free from sin. He is perfect in every way. He is morally pure, morally perfect. He is holy. He is set apart from all sin. So then, well, as we'll see in a couple moments, that means that to be holy for us means that we are to set ourselves apart from sin. Now, there's one other way that God is, at least one other way that God is, is, is set apart, and that's that he's set apart from, from his creation. And I don't mean that he's aloof or distant or remote. I just mean that there's nothing in this world that is like God. He is far more excellent, far more transcendent. He is far more beautiful than anything else in all of creation. He is distinct from what he has made. He's, he's set apart in that sense. And theologians have often pointed out that there's something true about for us as well. Not, not that we're wholly separate from creation, but in, in our purpose. We've been set apart by God to serve him. And that makes us unique as a people. We're set apart to serve God. That's what it means to be holy. Now, let's look a little more specifically. How do we practice this? How do we set apart ourselves? How do we set ourselves apart from sin? How do we set ourselves apart for service? Well, that's where the first two verses of our reading are important. Take a look again, verses 13 and 14. Now, again, just a little technical detail here. Um, this verse is structured in such a way that there's one verb and then two participles. Now, some of you don't like English, some of you don't remember your English. I had to look it up too, so it's okay. But here's the detail, okay? You, you have a, a command, which is a verb. That's the main thrust of the sentence. And then you have two little participles underneath that that tell you how to do the command. Okay, is that a simple enough English grammar lesson for you? Some of you are way better at this than me. You can come correct me later. One command, two participles. So we need to look first at the command. What is the command? Take a look at your Bible. It's in the second part of verse 13. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. That's the command. That's the main thing that Peter is telling us. If we want to be holy, we need to set our grace upon, or set our hope upon the grace of Jesus. We, we said a couple weeks ago that, that where our hope is, where we set our hope, that drives us, doesn't it? Our hope drives us, it motivates us, it shapes us. Right? And hope is, is, is what, we, what we believe about the future. Hope is, is what we have confidence in in the future. And Peter says, remember that Jesus Christ is going to be revealed. And that needs to be your confidence, that needs to shape you, that needs to motivate you in the present. When I, was, I graduated from high school, um, I, I took a year between high school and college, and I worked. I, pro I think, actually I know, I worked more hours uh, that year, like per week, than I ever have since then and hopefully ever will have to work again. Now, please don't take that as mean I'm lazy today, I don't think. But it means I work fewer hours today. And, and here's what that looks like when I was in that year between high school and college. I'd go to work at uh, 10 o'clock at night. And I'd work all night long. I'd bake muffins and goodies at Tim Hortons. And then I'd finish it off work there at about 6.30 in the morning. I'd walk across the parking lot to my next job. And I'd work from uh, about usually 7 o'clock or 6.30 there till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I'd walk home, go to sleep, sleep for a few hours, get up and do it all over again. So I was working somewhere around 70, 80 hours a week sometimes. And it was grueling. It was exhausting. People shouldn't normally work that many hours. It's not good for you in a lot of ways. But I did it. And the reason I did it was because I knew that I had this goal. I wanted to go to college. I wanted to go and start my college career. I wanted to start studying. I was looking forward to that. I was anticipating that. I was excited about that. And so whenever I would get weary, whenever I would get tired, whenever I didn't want to wake up, I just think, okay, but this is all to go to college. It was hope. It was hope about the future that shaped the present. And Peter says, your hope your ultimate hope, your, your, your guaranteed bedrock of hope is the fact that when Jesus comes, he's going to look at you and claim you as his very own. Jesus is going to be revealed in the end and he's going to say, this child is mine. This, this one belongs to me. She is my daughter. She, he is my son. And, and when that is your hope, 
That shapes how you live, doesn't it? That gives you confidence in the present. That gives you security. Right? That, that's, that's the assurance, that's the promise that my identity is not found in anything I do. It's not found in anything I accomplish. It's not found in anything I own. It's not found in any of the things that I do to shape my daily life. My identity is found in who I am in Jesus. And when Jesus is revealed, he will claim me as his child. And more than that, it's the promise that, that Jesus will make all things new again. He is reclaiming and reshaping and redeeming all of creation. And so everything one day will be freed from the curse of sin and be made whole again. He's going to gather his redeemed people into the joy and glory of a new creation where we will live with him for eternity. That hope that will be fully revealed when Jesus returns shapes our present. And Peter says in verse 13, the first part of verse 13, he says, discipline your minds for that. Discipline your minds for action. Be sober-minded. In other words, reflect on these things. Think on them. Study them. Learn them. Put them into your mind now. I don't know about you, but there are a lot of things that can compete with that hope. Think of it this way for just a moment. Some of you, you know, you, you go on Facebook. This is not, by the way, a sermon against Facebook. It's just saying sometimes what happens... And if you don't do this on Facebook, you do it in other areas of life. You look around at what other people have. You look, look around at the kind of life that other people are living. You look around and you say, well, their kids are always so well-behaved and they take such nice vacations and everything just seems so perfect about their life. And then you begin to feel inferior. Again, if you, if you don't go on Facebook and do that, you probably do it in other areas of life. Right? And you begin to question yourself. You begin to feel less of a person. Because in a sense, you're, you're undermining your hope. You're forgetting the fact that, that who you are in Jesus is more important than anything else. And that when Jesus returns, he's going to claim you as his very own child. You get up every, in the morning and you, you're stressed about work and you're commuting and, and you wonder, what is the purpose of all this? Why does this matter at all? And there's a sense in which you're forgetting the hope of a renewed creation. There's a sense in which you're forgetting that Jesus is going to, to return and he's going to make everything new again and the work that we do today in the present, in hope and in faith, will actually carry over into eternity. And so Peter is saying, remember your hope. Discipline yourselves to hope. Fix your hope on the grace that will be revealed when Jesus returns. And then in verse 14, he says, if you have that hope, if this is your ultimate identity, then you need to discipline the way you're living. Don't try to fit in with the rest of the world. Don't try to let the world squeeze you into its way of thinking and living and acting. Live as an obedient child of God, verse 14. Don't conform to those old desires. Don't try to live for the hope of the rest of the world. You're a child of God. Your hope is found in Jesus. Hope gives birth to holiness. Hope gives birth to holiness. Now that's not all. There's more. If we want to take seriously this, this command to holiness, then we also have to, to, to pay attention to what it is that we fear. Because what we fear gives birth to holiness as well. This is an odd one, isn't it? But take a look at verse 17. In verse 17, you hear Peter bringing together two ideas that I'm not sure we usually tie together. Peter says, you call on a father who judges. A father who judges each person's work impartially. Now, father and judge, do those two ideas fit in your mind? I don't think we usually think of it like that. We think of a father, we think of a father that's warm, loving, caring, kind, passionate. That's how we usually like to think of God. And then... Judge can, can, if we misunderstand it, it can feel harsh and critical and you know, picking our faults and highlighting and showing us the things we aren't doing right and you're thinking, how can God be both a judge and a father? Well, I want us to actually think of this maybe a little bit, a little, a little differently. Let's, let's challenge ourselves on this a bit, especially if you know, you're sort of new to Christianity and you're thinking, you know, is this one of these things where Christians are looking at a God who's critical and judging? Listen, think of it this way. If, if, you, if you're a parent and you see that your children are making mistakes, they're, they're doing things that are 
you know down the line are going to introduce real pain into their life. If, they're, if their kids are making decisions that are going to be really destructive, they're going to you know, damage their future opportunities to get a job or have a healthy relationship, your heart breaks for them, doesn't it? And, and actually, you don't sit idly by. Especially if they're younger yet and you're still raising them and shaping them, you, you don't just say, well, you know, I don't want to be judging, I don't want to be mean. You actually speak up, you say, my child, don't do this. Sweetheart, don't do that. You're, gonna, you're, you're making mistakes. And it's not, you, know, you don't say that, you don't judge their choices in spite of the fact that you love them, but because you love them. You get that? Do you see that? You love them enough to say, this is wrong. It's hurtful, it's destructive, it's, it's going to cause pain in your life. See, and the idea of God as a, as a judge doesn't mean that God sort of wears two hats and he's you know, judge and harsh and critical one moment and then loving and kind the next. It means that he's a father whose heart breaks when his children are doing things that are destructive. And, and, and our lives are lived out each day in his presence and he, he cares enough about us to want us to not do things that are going to hurt him or hurt us or bring damage and pain into our lives. A loving father judges his children not in spite of their love, but because of their love. And we're called to, to live our lives pursuing excellence in his presence. If this awesome, perfect, almighty God who's excellent and pure in every way, if we're living our lives before him, we, that ought to bring out the very best in us. That ought to motivate us to live holy lives, right? Fearing God, living and aware of his awesomeness, ought to promote excellence in us. There's a TV commercial that aired, um, just aired, it was back in my hometown in Edmonton, and, uh, and I think it kind of makes this point. Now, you have to excuse me because I'm using a hockey analogy. Now, I, don't, I try not to do that real often because I know hockey is a kind, of a, kind of a rare thing here. So, so cut me a little slack on this, and if you're not into hockey, and if you don't follow this, then just take your own sport and substitute you know, your own superstar for your own sport, or take your own hobby. I mean, you can do it for music or just about anything else. But here's, here's the commercial. You had Wayne Gretzky, who was the greatest hockey player of all time, went back to Edmonton, where he played for like 10 years, and he went and he knocked on the doors of complete strangers. Just went to a neighborhood, knocked on the doors, and said, hey, you want to come up and play hockey? And so all these adults and kids were just flooding the streets, and they were playing street hockey with Wayne Gretzky. Now, think of yourself. You're an 8, 9, 10-year-old kid. You love hockey. You know who Wayne Gretzky is. Now, Wayne Gretzky says, come and play with me. Do you say to yourself, oh, my, I could never play good enough to impress Wayne Gretzky. I could, you know, I'm, let's just go play Legos instead. You'd never do that, would you? Not if you're a Canadian kid anyways. <laughs> You, you go out there and actually it brings out the very best. You play, you compete, you, you, you want to you show your best because you're in the presence of excellence. That's not a perfect analogy again, but it makes the point when we are in the presence of a Father who is awesome, excellent, perfect, pure, and when we revere God, then we want to bring out our very best. We have a God who loves us and, and wants, us, uh, wants us to live in such a way to please him. And Peter says in verse 17 that you call on a father who judges each person's actions. Now, it says that God judges us if we are believers, if we're God's children. It's not judging as in God is looking at our life and putting a little check mark next to every good thing we do and a little X beside every bad thing we do. And then when we get to the end, he's going to weigh out the X's and the checks and hopefully if there's more checks than we get into heaven. No. Our salvation is already secure. It's guaranteed. What it means to be judged by God in this way means that the way we live can either please our Father or displease Him. We have to live in such a way that we are trying to please Him. We, we want to please this holy Father, holy God, awesome God, or we displease Him. And Peter says, live to please Him. Live to please your Father. Live for Jesus, who is far more precious than anything else in this world. Peter says in verse 
18 and 19, he says, don't you remember, you have been redeemed. You've been taken back from that empty way of life. You don't have to live for those empty things anymore, whether it's money or sex or power or to impress other people. He says, if you put your hope in those things, if those are the ultimate goal and desire of your heart, it's empty. Your money isn't going to be there to comfort you when you're discouraged. Your marriage is going to disappoint you at times. Your family's going to let you down. You live for those things. If those things are the deepest desire of your heart, it's empty. Jesus has given his life. He loved us enough to die for us, to bring us back from an empty way of living. Jesus is far more precious than money or wealth or power or pleasure or anything else. Jesus is far more precious than any of those things. You don't need to live for those things anymore. You don't need to seek after those things anymore as the ultimate goal of your life. You have Jesus who matters far more. And I can see kind of maybe two reactions to, to a sermon like this. Okay, God says, be holy because I'm holy. Live your life as a holy person in everything. And on the one hand, some of us might hear this and it's going to fire us up. Oh, it's a project, right? I can go, I can pay attention now. How am I thinking? How am I speaking? How am I acting? And I, if I see I'm not so holy in this, I'm going to work at it, I'm going to try, I'm going to get it right. It's sort of like the, the gospel, do more, try harder. The, the idea that if we just work at it, we can do this all on our own. Now, if that's all you're taking from this, then what's going to happen is you're going to, well, you're going to leave here like a firecracker. You're going to go after holiness and it's going to fizzle up because there's going to come a point when you fail. You're going to say, I know I need to watch my words. You're going to discipline yourself at it and, and you're going to fail at it. And you're going to, well, if you do that enough times, you start to slide into despair. You start to say, can I really do this? And, and actually, that's maybe the second reaction. Because some of us here have made so many mistakes. You know how God wants you to live. You've tried. You've put your effort in, but maybe your past is so full of failures and so full of shortcomings that you say, I can't do it. I give up. I quit. You feel that, that burden of your own inadequacy. See, if holiness is, is, if we treat holiness like it's somehow our project, we're going to fail every time. If we treat holiness as something we have to create. It'll never work. It'll leave you either very, very prideful or very, very despairing or you'll fluctuate between the two. I want you to look at verse 23 because here's what Peter ends this passage with. Verse 23 and 25. He says, and we touched on this last week, but we're going to come back to it here. He says, you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the word of God. Now stop right there for a moment. We've been born into hope. We've been born into holiness. How? Well, Peter quotes the text there from Isaiah, talking about the eternal word of God. And then in the end of verse 25, he says, this is the word that was preached to you. In other words, we're born into hope through the word of God. And what is the word of God? Well, it's the, it's the word that is preached. And what is the word that is preached? Well, it is the gospel itself. Holiness is something that we are born into when we believe the gospel. And Peter actually explains that, although it's a little hard for us to see that, but if you go back to verse 19, he's making reference here to the Lamb of God without blemish, or with the precious blood of Lamb, uh, precious blood of Christ, who is a lamb without blemish or defect. Now I touched on this a little bit earlier in the service, but in the Old Testament times you had uh, you, you had the Day of Atonement. You had a time when all the people were expected to, uh, to, to set apart a lamb of their own, from their own flock. They had to choose a lamb, and, and that lamb actually had to be on display for a week. It had to be in public where anyone could come by and take a look at this lamb and see, now does that lamb have any deformities? Does its leg, uh, is, it, is its leg gimped or crooked? Does it walk with a limp? Or it's, is there any kind of imperfection in this lamb? Because to make payment for the sins of the people, the lamb had to be perfect. You had to offer a perfect lamb. 
And then when you had a perfect land and when it passed the scrutiny of the community, then you'd bring that land to the temple and you'd put it on the altar, you would shed its blood, and that would show the people and remind the people that payment has been made for your sin. And in the fullness of time, God came and did something better yet. I quoted earlier from the Gospel of John where John says, here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's pointing to Jesus. And at the end of Jesus' ministry, he's being put on trial. And you remember, he's kind of shuttled back and forth to all these different places where he's, he's being examined, he's being questioned. And Pilate says to him, he spends time interrogating Jesus and questioning, is this true? Did you say this? What about this? And Pilate comes to the conclusion, he says it to everyone, he says, do you remember? I find no fault in him. Do you remember that? See, that's the gospel's way of saying Jesus was the lamb without blemish. He was the one without defect. He was the one with no flaw or sin anywhere in him. But he was put up on the cross. His blood was poured out. His life was laid down as payment, not for his own sins, but for ours. And when we embrace that in faith, when we look at that and say to God, don't look at my life, but, but look at Jesus instead, then God looks at us and he declares us holy. He says, in my sight, I, I look at you free from all sin. You are holy. I've set you apart. You are holy. And then we're called to live it out. We're called to live out who we are. God makes us holy and we're called to, to live that. And one theologian scholar said, really living a holy life is really just learning the family resemblance. God's family is holy. It's been made holy. And we have to learn to practice that. We have to learn to live it out. But holiness doesn't start with us. It doesn't start with what we do. It doesn't start with how hard we try or how we think. Holiness starts with what God has done. And then we learn to live it out. We set our hope on Jesus. We learn to fear and love this God who loved us enough to die for us. And holiness naturally flows forth from that. Be holy, says God, for I am holy. It's not optional. It's a command that's made possible and made real to us through Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord God, we worship you. You alone can make us holy. You alone have given your blood, the blood of a lamb without defect, without blemish. You've laid that down so that we might be made perfect in you. And Lord, help us to set our hope on that grace. Help that love that you've shown to us, that grace that you've shown to us, that kindness that you've shown to us, help that to shape us each day. Help us to learn to do what pleases you. Help us to learn to say no to temptations and sins that are not right. Help us to live our lives before a Father who loves us enough and, and judges us impartially because of your kindness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.